In the mid-90s, Sega reigned supreme in the arcades. With their innovations made in 3D thanks to the model series of arcade boards, new heights were reached with classics like Virtua Fighter, Virtua Cop, Daytona USA, and so on. Then later in the decade, we'd see games like Sega Rally Championship, establishing Sega's dominance in arcade racing. However, there is one racer from that time that tends to get overlooked. I'm, of course, talking about Sega Touring Car Championship, an ambitious racer from the time that prided itself on realism over all else, much to its own detriment. Nowadays, the game remains more of a morbid curiosity rather than one of Sega's classics. For the hardcore, though, there's still something there, and we're going to dig in to find out what. Released in the arcades in 1996, Sega Touring Car Championship was ported to the Sega Saturn a year later in 1997 in both Japan and North America. Made up of a team of Sega racing veterans, including Sega Rally producer Tetsuya Mizuguchi, Sega Touring Car was their attempt at creating a realistic and high-speed racer that required tremendous skill to play. Based on the then-current German Touring Car Championships, you drive these incredibly fast and high-powered machines with very little compromises in performance, much like Formula One racing. Unlike Formula 1, however, these cars are based off of the manufacturer's existing car models, heavily tuned for racing. Closed wheel and incredibly grippy, so no drifting here. But you honestly wouldn't know that from your first impressions with this game. Let's start with what's here. Sega Touring Car is broken up between two sides, the arcade side and the Saturn side. Different unlockable modes will appear on either side for some reason. I don't know why they went this route with keeping them separated, but whatever. We'll stick with the Saturn side for now. You got your championship slash arcade mode, time trials, split screen versus, car setup, and an options menu. Choosing the main championship mode puts you in a three race series with seven other drivers, with a secret fourth track if you finish first in the series. At the start you have four machines to choose from, a Toyota Supra, Alfa Romeo 155 V6 Ti, AMG Mercedes C-Class, and an Opel Calibra V6 with three more cars to unlock. I honestly can't tell the difference in handling between them, but we'll get into car statistics soon enough. Once you've chosen your machine, it's off to qualifying to set a good starting lap time. Finally, we get our chance to have a real feel for these machines. Oh shit! This game makes a horrible first impression. Your car goes so unbelievably fast, they can't even turn if their lives dependent on it. It's no problem though, I'll just start hitting the brakes before a turn. That'll keep me on the track. Wait, what's happening? How am I not keeping up? Why does my car drift at every turn? Aren't these supposed to be like super grippy touring cars? The quick answer to all this is that choosing to play an automatic pretty much makes this game unplayable. Simply tapping the brakes makes your car lose so much speed and puts you immediately sideways. And this is by no fault of the player, that's just how the game handles an automatic. You can't play it too fast because you'll crash and lose speed. You can't play it too safe because you'll drift and lose speed. There's just no middle ground when playing this way and is enough to turn off so many people from touring car. But there is an actual proper way to play this game, but don't expect the game to tell you. I had to be taught in order how to have fun with it, so heed my words, child. First, you gotta play this game with the Saturn 3D controller. While the touchy analog stick doesn't help with the turning, the analog triggers are a key factor here, mainly for freeing up your thumb on the face buttons. Next, you have to play in manual transmission, and I know this may turn off most people who just want to boot up and race and have fun, but unfortunately, touring car just isn't that kind of game. Now here's the big trick. Every car in the game is a six-speed manual transmission. The cars accelerate so goddamn fast that the first three gears literally don't even matter. When you're up to speed and reach turn, simply downshift between gears four and five. That's it. You don't even have to hit the brakes either, with the exception of the third track with its 180 degree hairpin turn. Just accelerate and downshift and now you're playing touring car! This may not seem out of the ordinary for a Sega arcade racer, but unlike literally every Sega arcade racer, this is the only way to play this game. There is no other option. Play automatic and you will lose every time. Once you've got the handling nailed down, it's fairly smooth sailing from there. I'd be lying if I didn't say that this handling style was pretty fun once I got the hang of it. If you're still struggling, then this is where the car setup can come in handy. You can take any car and tune up its statistics, like handling, acceleration, brakes, and lots more. Just a bit of tinkering, and you can have any car handle exactly the way you want it. Car handling is just a fraction of what this game has to offer, though. You got the championship mode and its four race series to conquer. The tracks have a steady increase in difficulty as you progress, with the latter tracks really challenging your driving prowess. I personally really like the second track, which really pushes you to keep your speed throughout, with only a handful of challenging corners to navigate. Once you've completed that, you'll start unlocking a slew of new stuff that's exclusive to the home versions. 
A fifth track called Boomtown Circuit becomes available with a remix of Condition Reflex from Sega Rally that plays. On the arcade side, you can unlock both an Expert Mode and a Grand Prix Mode. Expert Mode is pretty self-explanatory, but Grand Prix Mode has you choosing one of the original four tracks and driving a full-length race. In this case, a 20-lap endurance run. Your car will also begin to degrade in this mode, forcing you to take pit stops in order to finish at a decent pace. It's super cool to see something like this here, and we're not even done yet. Back on the Saturn side, we've got Global Net Events. Setting the Saturn's internal clock will allow you to play one of three different events. For Christmas Eve, you can race on a wintry-themed version of the Boomtown Circuit, complete with Christmas trees. For February 13th, the day before Valentine's Day, you can play the unfortunately ill-conceived Hit and Run Challenge, which has you race through the first three tracks while hitting as many cones as possible. The more cones you hit, the more time it takes off your total lap time. Finally, for March 31st, on the eve of April Fools, you drive on a track going in the opposite direction as you try to avoid head-on collisions with the rest of the pack. All of these are fun little diversions and can be unlocked with just a cheat code without having to set the system clock. Finally, we have my favorite unlockables, the extra cars. First up is the Sega Racing Prototype. It's got a cool look to it, but handles like all the other cars. What makes this car special is that you're actually teaching an AI to drive like you. As you continue to race with a prototype and set lap times, you'll be improving this AI to the point where you can just have it play the game for you. It takes a while to get to that point, but this is pretty revolutionary for a racing game at the time. You can also race against the AI in Versus mode. The last two cars are pretty special. After implementing a cheat code, you can actually drive the Toyota Celica and the Lancia Delta from Sega Rally. They even handle differently from the rest of the cars, but not quite the same as they did in Sega Rally. These will take their own time to practice if you have the patience. At the end of the day though, holy crap, there's so much stuff in this game. What could have been a simple arcade port instead is Sega's most feature-rich racer on the console. One greater aspect of the game is the presentation. Compared to later Sega racers from this time like Sega Rally, Manx CT, and Daytona CCE, Sega Touring Car has a notable lack of polish. Tons of polygon warping and a low and inconsistent frame rate can be pretty hard to stomach. It's certainly not unplayable, but it's definitely not easy to look at. The game just tries to run too fast for its own good. A big area that Sega nailed though was the soundtrack. If you love some over-energetic EDM, this is the game for you. And if not, there's a total of three different soundtracks to choose from, so you're bound to find something you like. Throughout the history of me making this show, I've had nothing but negative things to say about this game. It all came down to that initial first impression and not learning how this game handled. Once I actually sat down and learned it, I had a fantastic time. That being said, I still think the controls are pretty bad. I may have learned them and had fun, but I don't think that excuses it. The developers attempted to go for realism over intuitiveness, and it has only harmed this game's reputation. I feel like a line has been crossed when the act of driving a car in a racing game is just so incredibly difficult that it just pushes people away. So, where does that leave Sega Touring Car Championship in the end? Well, if this all sounds like fun to you and you're willing to commit, you're in for a hell of a time. It's an incredibly rewarding experience once you finally nail it, and one that even rewards handsomely. Sega Touring Car was Sega's attempt at making the most realistic racing game available, and that's not what we got. Instead, we got their most ambitious, controversial, and misunderstood racing game that will forever be remembered by those who knew it. Oh, no.